If you live in the Western United States, you already know that Burr Morell season 2021 is almost upon us. So I wanted to give you the heads up about Burr Morell maps from my friends Kristen and Trent Blizzard over at Modern Forager. They take U.S. Forest Service data about wildfires and then pick out the best potential morel burns across almost every state in the Western U.S., you can find the maps at modernforager.com. They will take your burn morel game to the next level. And again, that's modernforager.com for burn morel maps. Hi there. Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today, we have the humbling opportunity to speak with the incomparable Professor Suzanne Simard. Suzanne is a pioneer on the frontier of plant communication and intelligence. Often compared to Rachel Carson, she is hailed as a scientist who conveys complex technical ideas in a way that's both dazzling and profound. Her work has influenced millions, including filmmakers, think of James Cameron's Avatar, and her TED Talks have been viewed by more than 10 million people worldwide. We at Mushroom Hour have had the chance to read an early copy of her first book, Finding the Mother Tree and we have been mesmerized by how Professor Samar brings us into her world, the intimate world of trees, in which she brilliantly illuminates vital truths that trees are not simply a source of timber or pulp, but are a complicated, interdependent circle of life. That forests are social, cooperative creatures connected through underground networks full of mycorrhizal fungi, by which trees communicate their vitality and vulnerabilities and live communal lives not that different from our own. Suzanne, thank you so much for joining us on Mushroom Hour. Thank you for having me. It's my, my pleasure. Well, it is definitely an honor to speak with you. For any listeners, I'm assuming most are familiar with your work, but for any that aren't, you are one of the really seminal figures in bringing us this understanding of the forest network. Your 1997 article really bringing forth this concept of the wood wide web. So I think as mushroom lovers, we have a lot to thank you for <laughs> in illuminating the mycelial world. Thank you. I'm, you know, actually in those discoveries that really illuminated my world too, and made me look at forests in a different way. And I'm so glad that that it is inspired people and and that you feel a connection to what I found. And that is what's so great about reading the book is we really get that insight into your journey. You know, as knowledgeable as you are now, you didn't weren't born into this world with this understanding of the forest. So it's really fun to follow your your path of discovery. And to kick us off, because it's also the beginning of the book, why don't you tell us a little bit about your family origins? Because I think it's really vivid and kind of explains maybe a, a huge part of why you are where you are today, but a little bit about the Samard family origins and how that influenced your path into forest ecology. So the Samard family, Simard, uh, pronounced in French, emigrated from France and moved to the sort of the Gaspé Peninsula area of, of Eastern Canada and into Quebec and, and lived for a couple of generations in Quetzicook, a little town that's a logging town in, eastern, in the eastern townships. And then moved across Canada in the early 1900s and settled in Saskatchewan for a little while and then moved further west. And they were actually heading to California, or they, so they thought, and took the train and the whole f family, you know, they arrived in a boxcar and the boxcar doors opened and there was a brilliant sunshine and they went, California! And they jumped out of the boxcar and landed up to their noses in snow. <laughs> they, they were actually in, in Enderby, British Columbia. So that there they, they basically stayed. They never actually made it to California. But they uh, settled in the in the Shushwap River area that is a sort of a, a river that comes out of a big lake called Mabel Lake. And yeah, in that area was actually territory of the Splatson First Nation. And um, they homesteaded along the river and basically made a farm and raised, you know, my great grandparents raised uh, their sons. And then my grandfather and my grandmother raised their sons and daughter right along the river and then got into forestry, actually right at the beginning. They were horse loggers. 
So they logged around Maple Lake. And so when I was a kid growing up, we spent a lot of time there around the horse logging and my grandparents and, and my uncles and so on. And they were all, you know, loggers, basically. And they logged along the lake. And so my grandfather would build, he built flumes and the, the logs, um, they'd take the horses way up into the bush, cut down the trees, and then they'd shoot the logs down, the flumes into the lake. And that's, they were bundled up into booms and then boomed over to the mouth of the Shushwap River where they kind of waited until spring runoff. And then once the water was high, they set them down to the local mills nearby. So I grew up in that environment and, you know, wandering in the forest with my my siblings and my parents and my gra- my uncles and grandparents. And, and to me, it was just like this incredible place. I mean, it was It was what we knew, these old growth forests. And the picture, these are what we call the interior or the inland rainforests. And so they're they're like the iconic West Coast forest, but they're inland, which means that there's a little bit, the weather's more extreme. There's tons of snow in the winter. So there was the horse logging happened in the winter and the summer. Uh, And they, they were like these iconic old growth forests with cedar and hemlock and white pine and larch and Douglas fir and this beautiful mix of species. And I remember as a kid being in those forests and just this mess of beauty, you know, all entwined and jumbled together and trees everywhere and huge old growth trees. And that's basically where I came from, like just a kid in the forest with my siblings and family in that horse logging era. And the descriptions of hand falling and horse logging. I mean, for one, it sounds like it was pretty dangerous. You know, you talk about people rolling on these logs down the river and them coming down the flumes and kind of crashing into the lake. It's a great story that kind of tells that history, but it also gives us this insight into how trees and the forest and this appreciation for forest ecology is in your blood, because that was something else I took away from this. Your family in those early days of timber harvesting they may not have had the scientific elucidation and understanding of, you know, forest diversity and healthy forest ecology, that a lot of your work helped elucidate for the rest of us. But they did seem to have an understanding of that in those early practices that meant that they were being more selective in trees they picked. And they seemed to be more in tune with these concepts of forest ecology that you would later discover. Yeah, I I agree. My grandfather was always made the point to say, you know, I want to have a light touch on the landscape. And so they would selectively log for, well, they started with white pine because there's beautiful white pine in those forests and um, and they were huge old growth trees. But they only took a few. And then later on, you know, there was, as the province was putting, you know, roads and telephone poles across the province, they, they logged for cedar poles. So those are sort of like the intermediate sized trees and sold them to bell pole. But, you know, when when they took out these individual trees, very selective, they would create gaps in the forest, of course. But as a kid, I never really understood that it was a gap, but it was a gap. And the seeds would just fall down from the, you know, the remaining trees and seed into those little gaps and then just grow up as this lush forest that was regenerating on its own. And so when I looked on that landscape, you know, from Maple Lake, we used to always live in this houseboat and... You couldn't tell that there was any logging there. You know, you could when you walked up in it, but you had to have a pretty trained eye to see any kind of disturbance. And I certainly didn't see it. And so eventually in time, it moved to be a different kind of logging. And I later discovered as a young forester myself, which was so different than what my grandparents and my grandfather and and great uncles did. Yeah, and it's interesting because as that technology advances, roads come in, it seems like we move further away from maybe that intuitive understanding of how the forest should remain healthy. And that kind of, not that we'll go in sequential order through the entire book, but that kind of fast forwards us to that vivid story about you as a 20-year-old working in the timber industry for a logging company, which seems to massively influence this part of Western Canada, of course, there are loads of trees. So naturally, that is the industry that becomes a dominant force there. I guess to set the table, because your discoveries then help us figure out the truth behind forest ecology, the network forests, what was that understanding as a 20-year-old logger, kind of that mainstream understanding that people had about forest health? And then maybe you can tell us a little bit about 
free to grow policies, just because that's such a centerpiece of your research and really your whole experience, you know, both with timber companies, regulators, forest service, kind of what that baseline view of forest ecology was when you started out and what free to grow policies are. Yeah. So forests go through something called succession. And succession is like the change in uh, species and structure over time following a disturbance. And so in the logging that I observed, succession, we would say, was quite advanced. That means that, you know, when they created these small gaps in the forest, it's quite shady. And so species, even though there were many species in that forest, about 15 actually were in Mabel Lake, it was the shade tolerant species that really loved in the more closed gaps. So that would be hemlock and cedar. And then the bigger openings, there was Douglas fir and Western larch and Western white pine. They're more shade intolerant. When that sort of practice of selective logging, which really dominated the forest industry or forestry or the development of British Columbia in the early part of the 1900s, by the 1960s and 70s, or the 70s anyway, that was being taken over by industrial logging. And when I say industrial logging, you kind of alluded to it in your question, but it is instead of small operations, like they called them JIPO operations when, you know, these small family operations, you know, the Forest Service developed policies for basically divvying up the what's called the allowable annual cut among forest companies. So these are larger corporate companies and they move from small selective logging outfits to large scale clear cutting. So when I became a forester, this was the dominant mode of of harvesting. It was clear cut and plant like Douglas fir or lodgepole pine or spruce. You know, through the 1980s, the government realized because there wasn't very good regulation over reforestation back then, companies weren't actually required to reforest. They weren't required to plant. I mean, they were required to, I think they were required to make sure that there was something growing back, but it wasn't very strong regulations. And as a result, There was a lot of clear-cut land, which was coming back to deciduous trees like birches and aspens and and cottonwoods and maples and so on. Um, But in the understory of those deciduous trees, there were always, you know, these naturally regenerating conifers, like, you know, the ones that were there naturally. But the foresters um, became really worried about this because, and there were lots of influences from the U.S. where there was a big focus on trying to grow fast timber, and it was a competitive environment, and they were working on getting rid of what they thought as competition, the competition in those plantations. And so in the mid-1980s, British Columbia especially started listening to what was going on in the U.S., which was really an agricultural model of managing forests, and said, okay, this is why we were seeing all these brush fields, what they thought were brush fields, and we need to get rid of this competition. So the competition idea, this focus on competition, it harkens back further than this. I mean, it it really, you can go back to Darwin, you can go back even to Descartes, and it's this progression of Western European philosophies that put the, you know, the, the emphasis on competition. And evolutionary theory that Darwin came up with was about the survival of the fittest, natural selection, based on competition, and this is what allowed species to evolve and pass on their genes to next generations. So this this kind of philosophy or this theory was adopted in forestry and agriculture and applied to those fields as well, which made sense from if you're talking about breeding of trees or the evolution or the adaptation of trees to different environments, but they applied it to ecology too and forest management. And so the emphasis became, if we just manage the competition, we can grow these big trees that we're making a ton of money off of. And so they they said, okay, if we get rid of these other plants, basically they're the native plants, right? The berry producing shrubs and the grasses and herbs and the deciduous trees. And, and they said, this isn't what we want. We want these conifers that are so lucrative. And so they followed sort of like the pol- or developed policy following the U.S. model, which was to get rid of those plants. And so they, in order to make the companies do this to create conifer plantations, they required them to plant and they required like certain species and certain densities. And then they required them also to make sure they were free to grow. Free to grow means that they're free of these pesky competing plants, the ones that are sort of like the early successional understory plants. And so that launched that enactment of that 
policy in the in the Forest Act of 1987 launched a whole forest practices based on getting rid of the competition. And so that meant herbiciding and spraying and, and cutting and girdling and anything they could do to get rid of these pesky broadleaf plants. You know, then I was coming along at that time as a forester and going, this is kind of weird because we're creating these sort of clean plantations that don't look at all like the forests that they originated from, which are complex and diverse and, you know, entwined and interactive. And we were so focused or they were so focused on growing these big trees free of their neighbors with the idea that it was like a like a pie and that pie would get split up. You know, we don't want to give any pieces of pie to the plants we don't want. We want all that pie to go to the conifers. Not understanding at all that, you know, there's a lot of synergies among species, that there's natural succession, as I as I mentioned, that when there's a disturbance, that nature has a way of healing itself. It, you know, there's certain plants that establish first, they heal the soil, and then later conifers will come in. And so I think the idea was, well, we can get rid of that first stage we're going to go straight to conifers and make sure that pie is all going, pie of resources, so light water nutrients, is going straight into these conifers, and then we can grow these great big trees. So that's the idea behind the free to grow. And thank you for explaining that, because it is such a central theme, even in your research that subsequently is looking at these questions of mycorrhizal networks and their function, a lot of what you're aiming to do is show the deficiency or or how free to grow policies aren't necessarily grounded in science and you're trying to prove that no we can't get rid of everything so it keeps coming up again and again in the book and i remember my wife and i just looking at each other and thinking why did they mandate this and it does seem strange that basically the forest service uh, and I may not understand the relationships entirely, but the Forest Service should be kind of an oversight, if not governmental, kind of almost governmental objective group trying to protect the forests and keep forests healthy. But clearly, they got kind of intertwined. Their goals kind of got subsumed by economic goals of timber companies, because it would seem like this kind of policy is more grounded, like you're saying, in that economic goal of we need big, tall, straight conifers versus what's actually making a forest healthy. And so, yeah, just you trying to question that policy ends up kind of making you a renegade when really I would think that would be the function of the Forest Service the whole time. I agree. You, you got that right. So, um, you know, I actually started working for the government, right? I was a researcher for the Ministry of Forest and Range. That's what it was called at the time. And you know, as a researcher, your job is to support policy, forest policy. And so, you know, it's not that you have to necessarily agree with the policy, but ultimately they really want to know what's going to help them cut more trees, right? If you propose a policy that's going to reduce that rate of cut, that's not looked on as favorably as like a policy like, you know, growing trees that are genetically bred to be bigger, right? That That right. is a popular policy. So I was when I was looking at these free to grow plantations and realizing that when they were weeding out, I started looking at birch especially, and started seeing that these forests were less diverse. And you know, most concerning to me was that they, you know, they were full of they were getting diseased. And so there are there's all kinds of fungi in soils. There's you know big groups of them. There's pathogens. There's saprophytes. There's mycorrhizas. There's endophytes. But the pathogens in in particular in these more cleaned forests, we're really having a heyday because, you know, it turns out that the birches and aspens were hosted, to, for one, they weren't as vulnerable to these pathogens, but they also hosted a whole uh, soil food web consortium that was kind of served as an antibiotic to the pathogens. So that homeostasis among the different fungal groups and species and bacteria was disrupted with the cutting out of the birches and the aspens. And so, the pathogens then, without that healthy food web, really took off. They kind of took over and dominated the food web and infected the roots, and then it started spreading through the conifer plantations. And so it was like, oh, you know, this isn't what we want. The response to this was, well, if, if we're getting more pathogens in our forest, well, let's just pull out the root systems that are getting infected so we can still grow these simple Douglas fir plantations. And so then they went to this huge effort and pulled the stumps out. And I was at the time saying, why don't you just keep the birches? Because they're this natural band-aid to 
to the clear cutting that they help right. us heal. But that wasn't, you know, that wasn't supporting the free to grow policy. It certainly was not that can do attitude that we can make this force what we want. And so, yeah, there was a ton of resistance. And of course, at that time, I was also trying to figure out what the fungi were doing in the forest. And that's what led to my PhD research. It sounds like you had an intuition that we needed, even before you discovered the fungal networks and the whole complexities of the soil food web that you ended up really pulling apart in all your subsequent research, you had an instinct. And I remember that story of you as 20 years old, looking at those yellowing seedlings at one of these clear cut plantations and thinking, this isn't how it's supposed to be. And you had this instinct that the diversity was needed. You know, what Mm -hmm. if these other plants are needed in this system? And then you discovered the mycorrhizal fungi and you tell a great story about picking that big pancake Willis, and then going back and researching it. So it's fun to follow someone who's explained the mycorrhizal network for so many of us to hear about you discovering the mycorrhizal network. Now, were these ideas about the, the soil web and fungal populations that we all take for granted now, was that understood by certain scientists, even in those early days? You know, when you started picking up the torch and researching this, was this something that was understood and just suppressed, you know, to make way for kind of the more economic centric goals? Or was this really kind of a frontier, entirely new area of research? I would say it depends on your perspective and and how far you look back. So, you know, after doing my work for many years, I started working with a Simpson fishery scientist. Her name is Dr. Teresa Ryan, and she showed me a lot of history, written history of the, actually the Coast Salish people, and not just the Coast Salish, but also the interior Salish people too, that talked about these underground webs of fungi and how that the, they were these social networks that underlaid the forest and they were so crucial um, and to conserve and, and protect those networks. I didn't know that when I started on my research, but now, you know, I look back and I think, of, of course, you know, it's been known and they talked about it and wrote about it, but it was ignored. Okay. So taking that into account, when I started out as when I was 20, which was in 1980, a couple of years later, there was a scientist in the United Kingdom called David Reed, his Dr. David Reed, his Sir David Reed now. And he was doing some studies with his graduate students and he was a mycologist. So somebody who studied fungi and he did these cool little lab studies where he grew an individual seedling and then he grew two seedlings together in the same pot. And he found that they actually formed a common network, a common mycelial network. And so that is of the mycorrhizal fungi, which um, I didn't mention that it's an obligate mutualistic association between trees and the fungi where the seedlings or the trees fix carbon through photosynthesis and provide that food to the fungus, which the fungus then uses to grow through the soil, pick up nutrients and water and bring them back to the plant in an exchange. That's why it's called a mutualism. They both benefit. Um, So it turns out this mutualistic fungal network of mycorrhizas could link these seedlings together. And then to visualize this, he actually labeled one of the seedlings with radioactive carbon-14 CO2 and it photosynthesized, took it up, And then he was able to use this photographic emulsion over his root boxes to see that he could trace it going to the neighboring plant through the network. And so this he published in Nature, which is like one of the most prestigious journals in the world. I think subsequent to that, you know, I wasn't really aware of it at that point. But during that, you know, the 1980s, then the people in the UK started sort of playing around with this idea more and you know, looking at different kinds of mycorrhizas and they're saying, yeah, I don't think this is very important or it's not important to plants that these these networks. And so when I started my PhD in the early 1990s, 1992, I was really interested in finding out what was creating this imbalance in the soil among the fungi in the forest that was causing these pathogens to proliferate. And I learned about the work of David Reed and I thought, ah, it could be that when we take the birches out, we're, we're tearing the network apart and that this allows space for the pathogens to move in and, and dominate. And nobody knew at that point if these networks actually existed in forests and what they did. 
I then took that mantle from David Reed and that early research and said, okay, let's see if this is happening in our beautiful Western forests, which are so different than in, you know, the moors of England. But when I started that work, I was able to see that, yeah, these networks do exist and that they link actually different species. The birch and the fir were actually linked together and that birch and fir were passing carbon back and forth between each other. And even more, you know, that the more that the birch would shade the Douglas fir, the more it would give carbon to Doug fir, which was, you know, the antithesis of the idea that competition was the only thing that mattered. Suddenly I'm showing that collaboration is important too. They're both happening. They're competing for sure, but they're also sharing carbon. And really what I think is going on is that the community of forests, you know, that there there's these groups of species that create communities that are quite stable and they they have a, a balance in them. And that mycorrhizal network is a balance and it's and it keeps the pathogens in check. And when we disrupt it or basically take the birches out and disrupt that network, then that balance is gone. And then you get these infestations. Which makes all the intuitive sense in the world. And of course, I'm coming from a perspective where people like yourself have already brilliantly elucidated this concept. So it's hard for me to get away from it. But it would only seem logical that there are these intricate systems in these natural environments co-evolved over millions of years, that interrupting them would, of course, have some kind of fallout. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's hard to even see that short-sightedness. And when you first discovered these mycorrhizal fungi, did you have any inclination or instinct about just how many capacities they had in a forest? I mean, because you actually tell some stories of even earlier in your life, and it's a beautiful description about you talk about these roots covered in these beautiful colors of different fungi. But did you have some inclination? I mean, before you did the research to really prove it, did you have some instinct that, okay, these are going to be important? These are Maybe you thought, yeah, these might be passing water, nutrients. Did you kind of have that instinct early on in your relationship with mycorrhiza, if you will? You know, I I intuited. I knew from my own history that the forest was like this entangled place. I knew that, you know, if you live in a forest for hundreds of years as a tree, you're going to be entangled with your neighbors. I knew that, right? right. Who wouldn't? You walk in the forest and you, I mean, that, that's what you see. I knew that at least. But I didn't really know about mycorrhizas when I got started. I mean, I'd heard about them in, in my universe, my undergraduate degree, but it was more like, let's inoculate little seedlings and see if they grow better. You know, still focus on that idea of growing bigger trees. And it was more of a nursery application. And it didn't really go that far because the, it turns out that soils naturally are just full of inoculum, right? Inoculum being the spores and the mycelial network that trees and plants just link into and become colonized with. And so when people were trying to artificially add these inoculums, these spores and so on, to forests, they just disappeared in the the sea of, of natural diversity out there. So I can't say that, you know, when I started that I, I didn't really have an intuition about the networks themselves. Mm. But when I read about it, I thought, oh, when I first read about it, I thought, oh, this makes a lot of sense. And so that's what got me started on it. it. It wasn't like I could dig up the forest floor and say, you know, even though I could see, you know, as a as a novice forester, I could see these roots had these funny fungi on them, but I really didn't know what they did. That leads us beautifully to that PhD work that you set up, probably the most seminal work in terms of that publication of the Nature article. We could get into to all of that, but you know, in taking on now Sir David Reed's mantle, tell us a little bit about the experiment that you had to structure and really, you know, what you learned from trying to pull his insights in the lab into the field. So I guess the process of that PhD research and then uh, what your findings were. Yeah, um, the experimental design had to be really carefully done because I wanted to see, you know, what these trees were sharing were they just competing? Were they collaborating? Were they sharing things? And how were they doing it? There was that hunch from David Reed or that in early work that suggested these mycorrhizas were involved, but I didn't really know. And I had to test for that. And so I had to create these treatments where, you know, I could allow Douglas fir and Birch to, to hook up in a network, but I also had to figure out, you know, what if there's nothing moving through it? Or what if what they're receiving isn't through mycorrhizas, but just through the soil? right? That they're right. just leaking carbon into the soil and then 
it gets transformed by the soil food web and then picked up by another tree, which fits into that model of competition, right? That that it's just like a dog eat dog world or a bug eat bug world. And so I had to devise this experiment where I could I could separate these things out, transmission through the network or transmission just into the soil. And so I used another species called Western red cedar, which forms an entirely different group of mycorrhizal fungi than birch or fir. They form what's called an ectomycorrhiza, and cedar forms an arbuscular mycorrhiza. All that means is that the ectomycorrhizas are a suite of species that form a mantle on the outside of the roots, and uh, the, the fungus actually doesn't go inside the cell of the of the cortical cells of the trees. They just wrap themselves around it. And it's through that the cell walls and membranes of the plants and fungi that this magical exchange occurs. But in the arbuscular mycorrhizal world, there's far fewer species. There are simpler networks, but the, the fungus itself actually penetrates into the cell of the tree and then they make this little tree an arbor. <laughs> it's called, that's why it's called arbuscular mycorrhiza. Right. And it's at this arbor that this exchange happens. And so that cedar couldn't link into the network of the ectomycorrhizal network of birch and fir. It was just on its own. And so I labeled my birch and fir with isotopes. And then I tried to detect how much ended up in each types of these plants. You know, was it in the ectomycorrhizal plants or did it actually go over to the cedar, which would suggest it moves through the soil? And what I found is that, you know, cedar picked up a very, very, very tiny amount compared to birch and fir, that they were actually in this really dramatic exchange with each other. And cedar was just sort of like off in its own world. And so that was really convincing evidence that this network that was linking birch and fir was the conduit through which carbon and nutrients were passing back and forth. And I have to say, at the same time, in the, in the mid-1990s and late 1990s, I wasn't working in this area, but there were other people working on transmission of information through the air as well. So I was working on this below-ground community, and Richard Carbon and his group in, in California were working on transmission of messages above ground, these volatile organic compounds. So we were getting a pretty sophisticated view around that time of this interaction that was like basically the plants communicating with each other through these networks and through the air as well. Well, and you do a beautiful job of telling the process of this big experiment. I believe it was your mentor at the Forest Service, Alan, that kind of brought you into things, who told you, hey, you're really going to have to understand experimental design. So we get this beautiful insight from you about learning how to structure experiments uh, statistically, and then how to try to control for all these different variables. I mean, it kind of boggles the mind what you have to think about to set up an experiment to answer what are seemingly simple questions ends up being a really, really complex process. So when we go through that process with you of being in the field, going through this experiment, there's interfused in there, these beautiful relationships with family and people that you work with in the lab. You know, that's one thing I love about the whole book is it's suffused with these amazing interpersonal stories and things. Uh, And we're going through that, and then you're getting the results. What then was the reaction to the actual 1997 article explaining your work? And what did you learn from that process, maybe as a scientist, as a researcher, and kind of as a voice of the forest? What was that like for you? Because, you know, it wasn't necessarily received with open arms, (laughs) to say the least. That's a good way to say it. Um, you know, it's interesting. It depended on who the audience was, how they received it. Almost like I did this research because it was meaningful to, to me and I intuited that this was going to be important. But, you know, when I went and did the work, I remember in the Forest Service, they said, why doesn't she just study growth and yield, right? Growth and yield is how big trees grow and how fast and how much volume they produced. And then they can use that information to model, you know, how much they can cut. And I wasn't the least bit interested in that. Um, so <laughs> there, <laughs> there was, um, so there was sort of like that, of course, that commodity cutting mindset in the forest. Like it was, it was an industry, right? It was a money making industry. This was the ma- main economic driver in British Columbia, and so there was that resistance immediately, you know, surrounding that that I was doing this weird odd stuff that who really cares about it and then they I, th- I think they were absolutely surprised when when it got published in nature and they're like well what does that mean I don't think a lot of them even knew what nature was or the significance of that journal or 
And so it was like, oh, somebody in the Forest Service published in Nature. And so I would say for the most part, it was met with indifference at first. It was like they didn't know what to do with it. But then as the article came out, the practitioner side, the Forest Service, they got really concerned about it when I started talking to the media, right? So when something gets published in science or nature, the media get gets involved and they should so that the, the public understands. And so I ha- was having interviews and, and I said, you know, I was interviewing with the Globe and Mail in particular, this one, and the reporter, and I was nine months pregnant at that point, I was about to give birth to my daughter. And we were having this nice conversation about, you know, having babies. And suddenly it was in the interview and she was saying, well, what about that brushing of birch and taking out the birches? What, what do you think of that based on your research? And I said, well, all the good they're doing, they might as well paint rocks. And that ended up in the Globe and Mail. So the Forest Service was not happy at all that I had said this, that I wasn't supporting policy. I was actually throwing, I was actually criticizing policy in a very public way. And it wasn't like I was trying to undercut the Forest Service. I was just saying what I, what my, the results meant to me. And anyway, this created a great upheaval and I got in a lot of trouble and You know, I was also at the same time, because I'm a very practical person, I came from this very practical background, trying to do research, understanding, well, if these things are linked together, and we shouldn't be brushing out birch to throw the system out of balance, how could we manage these plantations so that they're healthy and diverse? And so I did all these, you know, so many experiments, I mean, literally hundreds, trying to get at how do we do this? How do we actually apply forestry so we get a good diverse community. And they were very, anything I did, it turned out, they were starting to get skeptical about it and didn't want to publish it. And ultimately I left the Forest Service because I felt like I couldn't move forward. So there was that side. And so they tried to ignore it as best they could or shovel it under or get rid of me in the Forest Service. I mean, that has changed now. I mean, now they're, they, they've embraced it in a lot of ways. And then there was the academic side. So when my paper came out and the academics were looking at it and saying, you know, this is actually really disrupted to ecological theory because there was so much emphasis on competition. And there were a few scientists like Lynn Margulis, who was out there, who was talking about the endosymbiotic theory and about collaboration and coevolution, but it really her work was also getting suppressed because mm. competition was reigned supreme. And so there was a great deal of resistance and, and skepticism, even among the academics. And I remember, you know, getting criticized and reviews being written about my work that, that were poking holes in everything I did, trying to find, you know, this was wrong or that was wrong. And, and I was so young, I didn't really know how to handle it, right? I didn't, I didn't realize that there was like all these camps out there and they were all these academics that were already kind of, butting up against each other and trying to be the greatest. And um, and so then I come in there, this young woman who's like out of nowhere and does this work. And they're like, well, we're not going to just change everything because of one study. And interestingly enough, eventually, you know, more and more labs started testing the idea. I moved on with my work as well. I moved to the academic environment myself and got to do many, many studies with my grad students and just verified you know, over and over again, what I'd found and advanced the work. Yes. So it was a rocky road at first. (laughs) Definitely. It was met with skepticism. I mean, the book describes beautifully kind of that process for you. And how much of this had to do with being a woman? And we could probably do many podcasts about this, but it's something that comes up both in that academic circle, obviously with the forest timber companies, and then the forest service kind of lumping those together. But you know, how much did being a woman play into this in terms of getting people to accept the veracity of your findings and the rigor of your research? Did that play into it? And and how did that feel for you? You know, I'm sure it played into it. You know, both forestry and academia, there weren't many women, Mm. especially in the academic forestry field. In fact, when I was an undergraduate, I was, you know, they were it was the first few years that they actually started letting girls into study forests. And Incredible. You know, they were trying to get us all to go into teaching and a bunch of us persisted. You know, so there was that. It's like if you when you hear about stories of women trying to get into male-dominated fields, like 
policing or firefighting or pilots or, you know, it's hard. And you hear these stories. It was the same thing. It's just that we were too shy and too few to actually speak out, at least in these other professions. You know, there's a becoming a critical mass and there's movements and, you know, and you can sort of hitch your wagon onto the movement and, you know, and it's revealed. But I think in the field of forestry, it really has not even to this day been addressed about how women came through forestry and all that we experienced. So there was that. And then in the academic world, I always like tell people, you know, too, that throughout my undergraduate degree, I had not a single female professor. When I did my master's, again, not a single one. And then my PhD, I had two actually that were sort of sub substitutes almost. And they were, you know, those were the first experiences I had as being mentored by a woman and they see things differently. And so I think that the work, it's like, there's ways of looking at the world, right? There's worldviews. And when everything is dominated by, you know, at that time, it was like males, white males from with European descent were dominating forestry, dominating academia. And when they looked at a system or a thing, it was through that lens, right? But there's so right. many different lenses for looking at the world, at different epistemologies. And women have a different way of looking at the world. We are different. And so this idea of connection and communication and collaboration in forests was like the opposite of how it was being viewed at that time. And so there was this huge resistance to that. It was just like, well, that's cute, but it doesn't matter. (laughs) Well, and I think it underscores me. You're already going up as a scientist with information that changes the entire paradigm of how we look at a natural system. Already, there's going to be a massive amount of resistance from any entrenched interest. But then to marry that with the fact that you were a woman doing this in a male-dominated field, it just shows, you know, this incredible barrier that you had to push through to really get this information out to us. You know, it's almost like you were doing this massive service to the rest of us to push through this current and get this truth and the scientific information out to us. And I think that that really comes through in the story and that perseverance, obviously incredibly admirable. And we have a lot to be grateful to you for you know, we could walk through all of your research, but that would, of course, take many, many episodes. It's all laid out beautifully in the book. You look at, you know, relationships with birch, with alder, with mature conifer trees and their offspring. But just to highlight some of the findings from that work, I had a couple of questions here just about the function of mycorrhizal networks and some of the things you discovered. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the book, you lay out the biology, the difference between arbuscular mycorrhizal and ectomycorrhizal really well. But just to highlight some of the big questions, you know, at the baseline, why do plants share resources with each other between species? You know, what what is the advantage for, for plants in that model? I think that, you know, when you look at sort of the advancement of biology and botany and, you know, a lot of the first emphasis was on the organism single organisms, single species, and then populations of organisms, like populations of a single species. And the idea of community ecology, which is multiple species interacting together, was really a later part of ecology. It wasn't until the, you know, the late 1800s that there were some ecologists in the U.S. that started looking at communities. And and so until that point, we were so focused on natural selection of a single species that the idea of how a community, how the species interact to build the health of a community was not understood at all. It was more like, well, let's look at how these individual, well, they happen to be growing together, but it wasn't really understood that there was a meaningful synergy among these plants. And so, you know, I think that a lot of the inability to look at a system like that, a complex system arose from our just the the growing of the science, that it was so focused on just one species. Now we understand or that there are interactions, that there are multiple ways that species interact and build in, and create like fairly stable complexes or species complexes. And we see them repeated over and over again. They occupy different niches in the forest, or you might have a consortium of plants in a wet area, another consortium in a dry area, but they have this ability to work together to cycle the nutrients and cycle the water and create stability in that community. You know, my example of the birch and fir and the and the pathogens and the mycorrhizal networks is an example of that. They're, they're a community that in working together, they create a healthy, stable, fairly stable community. 
you know, that you can predict it's going to be there because it works together. Then people started to think, well, it's really about individual species and natural selection. And then the people looking at community ecology came up with this idea of group selection, that groups could actually select for themselves, that these stable communities actually have an evolutionary habit to them as well. And that became really controversial. And a lot of the geneticists said, no, that's, that doesn't make any sense. You can't select, a group doesn't evolve. But, you know, you really can look at it as that individual trees will actually select, do better in their community, even though the species itself will, you know, operate or it will thrive in that community. It looks like it's, it's natural selection within it, its own uh, population. I hope that that's clear. But it is, and it just highlights the importance of, I mean, right now, so much is in flux, especially with the identification of a biological individual. You know, how do we define that? Is anyone, is there really an individual organism, you know, static from the rest of its environment? Of course not. So when we're looking at something, you know, I asked the question, why? Well, when you're looking at the why, you suddenly have to look at this much larger picture to see, well, why would they share between species? Well, if you want to call it competition, they do get an advantage in the long term in having other species be healthy that, yeah, in the example of the birch and fir, when the fir grows up and becomes much larger than the birch, the net transfer of carbon in that, you know, one example of one molecule, the net transfer of carbon actually increases. So suddenly the birch is getting more from the relationship than the fir tree. There's seasonal differences in these transfers. So yeah, when we get to why do mycorrhizal networks exist and why do plants use them and, you know, kind of loop everybody in there, even when it's not their same species, it seems like it, it is to build that healthy ecology all around them. So yes, that individual can thrive and then they all can thrive. So yeah, really yeah. important then. I mean, you're pretty much looking at any of your work necessitates this this view of community ecology, I feel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think we can't also forget about the fungus itself too, in that it right. benefits from this community as well. If you think of yourself as a, a mycelium, and you need certain things, like the thing that you need the most, your limiting thing is energy, the photosynthate that you get from plants. And so if you associate with multiple plants, you get more carbon. Now, keeping in mind that there is like this really tight market exchange between the fungus and the plant, that the more carbon a plant will give to the fungus, the more nitrogen and phosphorus it will give back to the plant. Like it is really quite a tight market exchange. Um, but mm. what if your host dies? right? What if suddenly it gets infected by something and it dies? Well, if you're linked to another plant, at least you've got another host there. And so for the fungus, it really is it to its advantage to, to associate with multiple plants at once. And this is how they become linked together. So the fungus itself is just as an important player in this whole network as the plants. And I have to say that, you know, almost all of my work, I focus so much on trees because I'm a forester, right? And so in my experiments, I really, in trying to understand the drivers of what makes things move from plant to plant through this network, I was really manipulating, you know, the condition of the plants themselves, creating some plants that would be like really rich sources of nutrients and carbon, and then other plants that may be a lot smaller or shaded or less nutritious, and creating it that, that had lower abundances of these resources, creating sort of like this gradient of resources from one plant to another and then manipulating them in that way and trying to see what drove carbon transfer and nutrient transfer i really did just work with the plants i didn't work with the fungi but other people have worked with the fungi in saying well what if it's a different fungus or what if it's ones that create big fat strands versus one that create little tiny strands you know does that make a difference and it really does right it all all the the fungi the plants the bacteria, the soil, they are all working together to determine this movement of resources through the forest. But really, when I look at it and I, I find the plants are very strong drivers, when I start manipulating their environment, I see I, the, the whole network responds and I'm able to trace that. Well, you just yeah imparted such an important perspective in that these are all sentient players. And that's actually something I've heard about folks commenting on the Wood Wide Web it's not necessarily the same as the internet because these aren't inert cables. You know, these are living organisms also making their own decisions. And that was a question I had that I wasn't sure was addressed in your research, 
But when energy is passed through the network, who's making that decision? Is it the tree deciding, you know, I want to send resources here? Is it the fungus making that decision? Do we have any insight into who's deciding what compounds go where? I mean, that's such an excellent question. And and of course, like, as I described, I've been working a lot with the plant community trying to figure out, are they the drivers? Right. And they definitely are strong drivers, right? They, their conditions, that field of conditions, that sort of contours of, of resource availability in the community, as it changes over, you know, from species to species of trees and so on, that shapes where things go, right? So if there's a, you know, a tree in need, then the resourceful trees will shuffle off resources to it. But the fungus itself also is such an important part of it too. It's just that I haven't studied it as much. Right. Well, and what you're talking about gets at this kind of source sink dynamic present that comes up so many times in the book when you're talking about, you know, sugars and carbon and Even when you get into the biology of the trees, how water moves, I mean, all this has to do with kind of source sink where there's an abundance and then it's flowing to somewhere in their immediate network Mm -hmm. that needs that resource. So yeah, that's another theme that keeps coming up in the book. And the namesake of the book, the mother trees, Mm -hmm. you know, what did you discover about how trees, first of all, identify their kin and what is a mother tree? That's such a great question. So, you know, these series of experiments I'd done for like two decades, you know, in trying to understand the functionality of the network, like how things are moving from between species within a species. And then even in those two decades where I was working on this, and I, to be honest, I almost gave up on doing it because I was getting so frustrated. But the sent- sentiment at the time was, well, you know, we can't actually see these networks we you know do we they really exist and so much effort in my experiments my students was spent on proving these things over and over again to the academic community so we could so we could publish our work and so finally i just my colleague dan Jarrell and i got a student kevin byler and said okay we're going to map what this network looks like we're going to try and dispel this skepticism that this is all a hoax (laughs) <laughs> right. So, so Kevin Byler uh, did his PhD and he basically went into six forests of Douglas fir. And I was really interested in just Douglas fir because it's so much simpler to look at one species when you're trying to map something and below ground because you couldn't see it. How difficult is that? And and so if we had multiple species of trees with thousands of species of fungi, it would just be like this huge task. Right. And so we just focused on Douglas fir. They were uneven age stands, meaning that there were old trees and then intermediate trees and young trees, like a whole range of ages. And I thought if we could show a network here, then we could start to understand maybe the dynamics of that forest. Like why is it self-regenerating under its own canopy? Like why, how do these seedlings survive in the deep shade when they're not getting enough light to support themselves through photosynthesis? And so we had this simple system of just dug for uneven age. They were natural forests. And then we studied one fungus or one, two sister species of one fungus called Rhizopogon vinicolor and vesiculosis. And there had already been quite a bit of work done on developing what are called microsatellites of the fungi for that Mm. species, which when you have those microsatellites figured out, you can actually identify individual fungi, not just the species, which requires the whole DNA sequence, but you could look at these little microsatellites or little tiny short base pair sequences and say, it's this individual fungus on this tree is the same as on this tree over here. And so therefore they're linked together. And that's, that's basically how we did that is using these microsatellites. And so there had been work done by Annette Kretzer already on developing these for Rhizopogon. Others had developed it for Douglas fir. And so we were able to map all the individual trees and all the individual fungi and reconstruct this map and show how Douglas fir trees were all connected. And what emerged out of that map was that these big old trees were the most highly connected. And that makes sense, even from a pure physical point of view, because they have huge root systems, right? They've got many roots going everywhere. And they're long, they're about as long as they are tall, whereas a smaller tree has got fewer potential connections. And so those big old trees were the hubs of the forest. And in complex systems theory, or when they make network maps, like neural networks, and this was a neural network map, right? Like 
Yeah, that, that analogy stands out. Yeah, it's like a, a brain. It's a neural network. Yeah, yeah, where you've got big hubs and then little nodes and then linkages like neurotransmitters between them and emerge like these complex networks have these same properties where you have a few highly connected nodes. So these are the big old trees and a lot of little nodes that are not as highly connected. Those are the smaller and smaller trees. And so then we thought, okay, there's these big trees that in graph theory, they called them hubs. And so then we started doing a bunch of experiments around these big old trees, like growing seeds around them where they were connected to them and not connected to them um, at different distances away, um, shading them, at, like all kinds of stuff. And found out that these old trees, when, when they were connected to the little seeds that were germinating, that they actually transmitted them water and carbon and nutrients, and this increased the survival of the seedlings. And so the trees, these old trees, were actually nurturing the young seedlings. You know, that idea of mothering sort of came from those experiments. But also, you know, the next question was, which would be obvious, I think, to anybody was, would be, well, do those old trees actually recognize which ones are their own seedlings? Right. That field is called kin recognition or kin selection, which is strong in the field of animal biology or human biology, but hadn't been looked at that much in, or very little in plants. And so we got together with one of those main researchers, Susan Dudley at McMaster University, and did these experiments um, with my grad students and her and had, you know, seed from a tree versus stranger seeds. And we found out from other trees that that those old trees those would actually could actually sl- recognize their own seeds, their own kin, and send them more resources and reduce their competitiveness of their own root systems to allow to create elbow room for their own seed. And so that idea of kin recognition, now we understand that happens in conifers. And so that even gave more impetus for us to call them mother trees. That's where that term comes from. It's such a powerful description. And just thinking of things in that way makes you see the forest entirely differently. You know, suddenly, if everyone really understood this, especially that they're able to recognize their own seedlings. I mean, it implies a sentience that you would think would make immediately everyone outlaw the cutting down of, you know, mature trees because they are such central parts at nurturing the rest of the forest. You know, and I guess with powerful insights like these, has the Forest Service, you know, policymakers and then maybe actual companies, have they, have you seen any updates or shifts in practices based upon this this powerful information? You know, I there's a slow moving towards it. It's not fast enough, but there's a slowly a recognition that this is important. Um it hasn't changed practices in the field, so we're still clear-cutting. We still target those big old trees because they're lucrative. And the dominant paradigm in British Columbia is clear-cut and plant trees, and so not leaving any of the old trees. Or if they do, they often leave the crappy ones or the ones on a, a rocky outcrop or in a swamp. Or It's not the idea that you're going to selectively leave the best, right? The best right. provide genes for creating even you know, more robust trees for the future instead we leave the crappy trees (laughs) i shouldn't say crappy but they're not you know they're not as the big old trees lived a long long time and been through multiple climate changes and you know have got a rich suite of species even fungal species that are old growth fungal species there's a whole suites of birds and lichens and mosses and amphibians and so on associated with these old trees and yet we still don't try to save them. I have started a project called the Mother Tree Project, where we're comparing the standard clear cutting, which dominates the pro, you know British Columbia and Western Canada, with selective cutting, where we leave individual mother trees or small patches of them and larger patches, and compare that to an uncut forest. And you know we find that there are so many benefits of leaving old trees. Um, not to mention the genetic capital that's there, the legacy of past generations, but that leaving old trees actually reduces the carbon, reduces the amount of carbon that gets volatilized back to the atmosphere when we harvest. We keep more in the ground, we keep more in the forest, the biodiversity is higher. There's so many benefits to it. And yet, you know, until we actually change how we view how we approach forests, which right now is that it's a commodity, it's to generate financial wealth for a few people 
<laughs> not and it's not as distributed as equitably as we as it should be and and so there's this exploitation still going on and and I have to say like in British Columbia when I was a kid it was a province of old growth now it's a province of clear cuts and there's no real end in sight the cut has not been brought down and if we're going to do any kind of selection cutting where we leave old trees you got to at the same time bring the cut down because we're going to have to, we got to leave more on the landscape. So I hate to paint a pessimistic picture like that, but we really only have like of our really productive forests, only a few percent of those old forests left. And so it is a dire situation. Well, and it is where the rubber meets the road. I mean, I think so many people are moved by these insights. Just when I, you know, paraphrase things from your book to people, well, you know, it's just these mind expanding things that make you see the forest differently. But, you know, it's that age old question of how do we get that reflected in both political policy and economic reality? And so I think it's important to lay out the reality of kind of where things are now. Yes, I do encourage people to go support the Mother Tree Project and keep pushing in this direction, because there are so many reasons why this makes sense none the least of which economic. You're passing on better genetics and likely healthier forests, especially when you talk about a century down the road in terms of combating things like climate change. You know, it makes all the sense in the world. So, you know, we need to kind of get over this, which is, again, a theme in so much of your research when you talk about these huge long-term studies. We've got to get over this short-term mindset and really look at the long-term, which I think is a symptom just throughout our culture in every way imaginable. But this is probably one of the most irrevocable changes that we're making by not adapting this long-term project because forests are built over centuries and layers of complexity. You can't just get those ecologies back. Uh, And for you, has that tool of anthropomorphizing really been effective at having this hit home? Because I know there are scientists that always caution against anthropomorphizing other organisms, you know, even this idea of a mother tree in their family. But I love it. And I feel like it makes the idea really resonate. Have you used that language and had that mindset because it it makes it more effective at conveying the information? Yes. (laughs) As a short answer is yes. You know, when you're trained as a scientist, you're told never to do that, that that is like taboo. Don't put yourself in your research. Don't you know, we are separate from nature, that we're, you know, we're just objective observers and we're clinical and we're just going to dissect this thing, this reduction of science. And don't call it something that's not using these clinical terms. Don't put yourself in it. And to me, well, I mean, I've spent decades not being listened to because who cares if a tree is interacting with another tree, but when you say that they're you know, that they're nurturing each other and communicating, we start to relate to it more. And when we can relate to these creatures as though they're equal to us, instead of us being feeling like we're superior and have to be dominant over them, we start to put ourselves in their shoes and seeing ourselves in these trees. And when we do that, because we're so, as a species, we're pretty arrogant and we think we are the, you know, we are fairly self-centered, but when we, we do have this capacity for compassion and empathy and to relate to things, which is our beauty too. And so I wanted to people to relate to the work and, and it took a long time to come up with, you know, to actually come to terms myself with using words like this, but you know what, like it's needed. The other thing I want to say is that I don't think that we should see ourselves as separate from nature. We are one. We are in all of this together. We have one earth. We're all here with the trees and the frogs and the whales. And and we've got to coexist. And we are built that way to have synergies and to create a beautiful biosphere that is balanced. And in order to see ourselves in that way, we need to relate to it as though there are mothers and our sisters and brothers and our first, you know, the First Nation, the Aboriginal people worldwide, we all have these roots in us, right? That we do see, you know, Sister Cedar and Brother Birch. And, and it's crucial, right? It's crucial that we get back to this, that that we don't put ourselves above it. In fact, by putting ourselves above it, we have exploited and destroyed so much. And we need to step back and redesign how we think or rethink of how we view the world. And so I think the anthropomorphizing in that way is helpful. I think that our Aboriginal people have always done that because they see the world in 
from that point of view and it's healthier, it's more sustainable, it's going to create a much better environment for future generations if we can get back to our roots of who we really are. So well said. And it's something you specifically call out in the book that I've thought so many times. Research like what you've done is kind of Western science teasing apart individual players, using that reductionist model to get at the nuts and bolts of how a biological system is working, figuring it out. And then you come to this realization that is basically mirroring exactly what Indigenous and First Nation and Aboriginal peoples have been saying for millennia. And that's always so striking to me is these concepts that always seem too airy of we are all one, everything's connected. That's all we're proving as the science progresses and especially as we get more advanced genetic tools to really see what's going on at a microorganism level. But it sounds like for you, these two epistemologies can exist side by side and they don't. it doesn't necessarily hinder science to anthropomorphize things and see things as connected, right? Not at all. I think that there's this, this term called two-eyed seeing. You could think of it any, ways, any way that you can see things from multiple perspectives as good. It, it gives you a broader, more holistic understanding of things. But when our Aboriginal science and Western science come together, there's going to be synergies. And I think that using Western science to show phenomena that have obviously have been there forever, um, but also have been known for millennia, as you say, that helps everybody, right? Because we've had this wisdom, we've evolved with this wisdom, we forgot about it for a while because we got so wrapped up in being objective and not anthropomorphizing. I mean, we do need to be objective still, but, but we sort of, in reducing things down, we forgot that there's a whole system there. And so I think that it doesn't hurt us, it helps us to put ourselves back in the systems. I also wanted to say one more thing about the anthropomorphizing. You know, the English language is restricted in so many ways, right? Like when we use, you know, terms like sentience and intelligence and communication, people go, oh, you can't do that. Those are meant for humans. Well, how else are we? We got to use words that we have to express these things we're seeing or invent new words. We haven't invented new words. So, I, you know, I've adopted these existing words. You know, and talking to some of our Aboriginal people, I was talking to Randy Cook of the Kwakwakwak Nation not that long ago, and he was saying in his Kwakwakwak language, the original language, there were words for this that were separate from intelligence and wisdom and communication. There were words that in the Kwakwakwak language that explained and described these phenomena. They had already many words to, they didn't need to anthropomorphize or separate these ideas away. It was just part of the language. And and a lot of that language is being lost, but we need to recover these words, these concepts, because they're rich and deep and they're helpful. Absolutely. We need to expand our language to really convey these concepts without having to qualify everything. I, I just see so many people who want to kind of uphold this rigor of science, very careful about being overly specific. And I love that you just pointed out, well, the English language is limited. We might not have the words we need to describe this phenomena. You know, when you talk about forest intelligence or yet yeah, trees as families, that's maybe the closest we can get. And on this note of, you know, working with native peoples and Aboriginal science, you know, I will throw in the caveat, we are not speaking for those groups. We are speaking from inspirations and certainly you've worked with them in a scientific capacity. And they are populations that are still here that can still impart these insights. You know, there's still, basically there is still a living Aboriginal Hmm. uh, indigenous tradition that needs to be integrated into our culture because we all know all of the ills caused by over-commodification and industrialization, much of which this modernism birthed out of Western European culture, we know that needs to scale back. And luckily there are still living cultures that can give us this other perspective to build in. Mm -hmm. And some work that you do that I think highlights that at the end of the book is this work with salmon. Tell us a little bit about the work with salmon nitrogen. Obviously, we don't have to get into all of it, but what's the work you're doing with how even salmon connects to the health of the forest? Yeah, I mean, uh, the forest and the ocean are connected. (laughs) We've talked about connection. Everything is linked. That that is another place where we think that we've Traditionally, you've seen them as like there's water and there's forests and plants, and they don't near shall the two meet, except in the estuaries and intertidal zones. 
But there is another vector, uh, which is the salmon. And the salmon are migratory species. They live most of their life out in the ocean, but they migrate back to their natal streams to spawn and lay their eggs and die. And so in that way, they're a, they're a vector or they, they can take the ocean back to the land and the land back to the ocean. And so when salmon are out in the ocean, they're eating plankton and, you know, different prey. And as they do that, they accumulate a heavy isotope of nitrogen. So most of our nitrogen is N14, but there is a heavier isotope, N15. It's got a a molecular weight that's just one gram greater per mole. (laughs) And that heavy isotope, then as you go up the food chain and the salmon are near the top of their food chain, it accumulates. It's like bioaccumulation of this N15, which is a stable isotope. It's not radioactive at all. It just can be used as a natural tracer for that thing that's accumulated it in the environment. And so as as it goes through its four-year life cycle, um, the salmon will accumulate N15. They go back to their natal streams to spawn. And when they do spawn, then their carcasses or their bodies decay. And also the, the bears and the wolves and the eagles pick up those fish and they'll take them into the forest where it's nice and safe and they'll eat them. The wolves in particular, um, they don't like to eat the flesh because they can get worms from the flesh. And so they just eat the brains and they leave the flesh to decay on the forest floor. And so when you go into these forests, you actually can see, you know, along the rivers, these salmon bones strewn through the forest. And when we were walking, when we were in these, we were doing our work up in Bella Bella in the Hiltzik territory. And, you know, you could go into these areas and you can see where the bears would actually take the salmon to particular trees. They're the biggest, oldest trees, and they would sit beneath these big old trees where it's protected. They'd have a view. Their their cubs would be beside them, and they would eat the salmon. And the flesh and bones that were left would decay, and then the mycorrhizas of the tree will pick up that decayed N15, and it ends up right in the tree rings. And so you can actually take a tree core, extract you know those years and years of tree rings, and look at the N15 content and figure out how much salmon ended up inside those trees. And just to give you an idea, a single bear can carry about 175 fish into a forest a day. In a particular tree, um, there's been estimates that about 80% of the nitrogen in those trees is from the salmon. Incredible. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. And so the salmon are nurturing the forest. The forest grows, it's productive and beautiful rainforest, and then they shade the streams For the salmon, so the temperatures are regulated. There's some detritus that ends up in the stream that feeds the food webs. And you can see how, you know, they're interrelated and interdependent on each other. And I I would also mention that the people are are interdependent with this whole web of life as well. The Hyaltsuk people, as with the other coastal nations, like this, the the Simsian, the Tlingit, they passively fished for salmon. They used a number of technologies, but one is the tidal stone traps. I mentioned Teresa, Dr. Teresa Ryan, who works with me. She's Simsian, and she's doing this study on these tidal stone traps. Where So the way the tidal stone traps worked, the, the nations would build these, these stone walls at the mouth of the rivers where the salmon would spawn. So in the fall, when the tide would come in, the salmon would get trapped behind, and when it would go back out, they get trapped behind the walls. And on the low tide, that's when they would fish. They would let the fish go back on the high tide, but on the low tide, they would basically just passively pick up the fish, and that was their harvest. But they always put back the big mothers, right? So mm-hmm. the big mothers had big eggs that were fecund and created bigger fish. And so in so doing, and being attuned to the the populations of the fish, they were actually able to enhance the populations of salmon. And then when, of course, when colonization happened and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans took over the fisheries, they prohibited the nations from using those tidal stone traps and they took over the harvest. Well, we know what's happened since then. You know, they basically take everything. They take the big mothers and the little fish. And and so our populations of salmon have, have crashed. For overfishing, poor technologies, loss of habitat, a whole host of reasons. Um, But that is an example of um, this intertwining, but also how we can learn from Aboriginal knowledge about managing these, these incredible resources. 
you know, the wealth that nature has provided us that we have exploited to the point of collapse. You know, we need to get back to these more intelligent ways of managing resources. And luckily, there are still teachers here that can share this with us to be honored and uplifted and respected. And I think that example tied all of these different threads we've been talking about so beautifully. And my jaw basically dropped when in the book, you talk about being able to detect the nitrogen from the salmon being a huge part of the forest health. And of course, but you were able to, to actually prove it and kind of this metaphysical level, I don't think it's, it, it seems like not a shock that this overly patriarchal dominator, if you want to call it society, would be totally focused on competition, would be not respecting the tree mothers or the fish mothers, or it's like, man, we have so much to learn when we talk about, you know, scaling back the quote unquote patriarchy that applies in so many fields. So much of this I, I'm picking up from from your work, if not explicit, then the connotation is there for me. Well, to be respectful of your time, you know, I could walk through every experiment, every part of the book, because I loved it so much. But I'm just going to run by a couple questions that I had for you kind of behind the scenes about putting out your first book. And the first of which, what was the process like for you to really tell your story? Because, you know, this whole book is interfused with an amazing narrative of really your whole life, including incredibly intimate and personal moments about struggles with illness, death. I mean, all the different things that come up in a life. What was that like bearing that so openly? Mm -hmm. Well, I had a higher purpose other than just revealing and pulling back the curtains on my life, which I'm actually a pretty private person, a shy person. My family is like, oh, my goodness, we put written all this stuff in the book. And um, everybody's like kind of a little worried about it. But what I wanted to accomplish with this is to show that science is a very much a human endeavor it's not to be feared. I wanted to pull back the veil and say, you know what, we, we're we humans doing this science and we do it from our hearts. We do it from our experience. I would never have asked the questions I had asked if I hadn't had that history of growing up in the forest, being around my, my ancestors who were horse loggers, being a woman and bringing my perspective to it, being able to interact with our first peoples and bringing that perspective. Like, I just really wanted to show that it's not something that just gets picked off like money off of a tree, right? It grows out of us mm. as people. We ask questions that are important to us and our our history, our intuition matters. It's not just like rote clinical test the next hypothesis and then the next one. It it really is a place of meaning and uh, and we're passionate about it. And yeah, I just wanted to dispel that myth. And I also, you know, I know a lot of people have are starting to write about these findings as well. And and I think that's great. Um, I think, you know, the more people that know, the better and appreciate it. But I also wanted to tell the real, you know, the real story of where it came from. It's it's not just like a couple of pages in a book. It's a whole lifetime of work. Absolutely. And there are some beautiful points in the book where there'll be some personal, powerful personal event, and you can see the line of scientific inquiry birthed immediately out of that. It's almost like it's either a powerful event or a bear chase or something <laughs> is needed to birth new scientific lines of inquiry or insight because the book does such a beautiful job of, of pairing the two together. And then I, I guess you've kind of spoken to it there, but what do you hope people take away from reading the book? It is your first book, despite having publications everywhere, given talks, your knowledge has pervaded everyone's life in one way or another through film, everything. But what is this first book to you? And what do you hope people take away from reading it? I guess I want people to reconnect with the forest and with nature. That's my ultimate goal. My, my What drives me, right? What drives me is I have children. I want them to have a good life. I want all children to have a good life. I don't want to see suffering. I think that, you know, we're in a you know, environmental crisis. We need to resolve this. We need to solve the climate change crisis. We need to, and give hope for future generations. You know, our First Nations talk about seven generations that we have a responsibility to the next seven generations and the past seven generations. And I feel that weight of that responsibility. So I'm hoping that the book will invite people back to their roots, invite them back into the forest, see it as a place of 
of rebirth and origin and wealth and life-giving, not something to be ignored and exploited and and thinking that it's all okay. Like we, it's not okay. We all have to get engaged. We all have to do our part and we need to do it for our children and for all the creatures in the world and ourselves as well. So that was my, that was my goal. Yeah. And also to try to dispel the distrust around science and show that it really is a place of passion and, and that, you know, it comes from a very meaningful place. Yes, you definitely humanize the scientific process and the stories of doing the experiments. I mean, it all feels very human and relatable and not kind of in an ivory tower, or anything like that. Definitely think that comes through. And then my final piece here, it sounded like at the end of the book that your eldest daughter may be picking up the torch. Is that the case? And what does that feel like for you to not only pass on this knowledge through all the work you've shared with people unrelated to you? But how does that feel to have someone in your own family picking up and carrying forward this work? It's really cool. I, I actually have two daughters, a Hannah and Nava. And Hannah's 23 and Nava's 21. And they both have are studying for us now. And of course, I followed in my uncle's and my grandfather's and great-grandfather's footsteps. And so it continues on through the line of people engaged in forests. My nephew is also starting to look at, you know, soil carbon and yeah, it's really, really great. <laughs> I feel like, you know, the the family ties, which I explained through the whole book, is that everybody's been involved in my work from the get-go, you know, from taking my dad out and my mom and my brother and all, you know, they're all in, involved and we're all linked. And it's just, it's really, it's really cool. It makes it seem like your family really has turned into this kind of avatar or voice of the forest through all these different lineages, that's kind of this powerful image I get. It's like, thank, thank everything that we have <laughs> this family coming through and carrying forward this insights. I mean, among, among many others, but especially at the end, when you talk about your daughter, Hannah, getting into the work and that explanation of some of the cleanup work you were doing in an old mining site just came through like, wow, thankfully this, this family is carrying the torch for the tree. I guess that's an odd turn of phrase, uh, carrying the banner for the trees forward. <laughs> Yeah, I always say this question is tough for anyone who's just released a book, but w what's next for you? Maybe what are some other lines of research you're really interested in pursuing? Yeah, I actually am writing a second book now. And it's actually because the first book, I couldn't get everything in. Um, it was getting too long and I couldn't I couldn't get into the Mother Tree Project itself, which is like my next, like I've been working on it for about six years. And and it's applying these ideas in real forestry and seeing how how to how to save mother trees and regenerate forests as climate changes. So we have resilient forests and diverse forests as climate changes because we need forests to, to stabilize our climate. And so that's been a big focus. And of course, writing the second book will be a big focus. But I'm I'm also really interested in I guess in a little tiny sort of curiosity driven research that is how trees are perceiving us. So, you know, trees, I've talked a lot about how trees perceive and respond to each other. They perceive and respond to salmon and squirrels and pathogens. And yet we are like the biggest force in the environment. How are they perceiving us? Like, obviously they're perceptive. And so I'm, I want to try and, and get into that. Well, the output of that research may totally blow away any veil that remained between us seeing trees as people. And if they start responding to us, I mean, it's going to be hard not to see them as other living sentient beings we're sharing this environment with. So incredible. I am really excited then to follow that research. And of course, anyone who's listening to this should already be aware of your work. And if not, they need to go get familiar immediately. Uh, so where is the best place for people to engage with you uh, and learn more about your work? Well, you can order my book. Um, you can pre-order the book on Amazon or the big networks, <laughs> Penguin Random House. Um, so you can do that. But I also have, like, I've given a few TED Talks. Um, you can listen to the TED Talks. And you can also become involved in the Mother Tree Project. It's a huge project. I'm, I have an open invitation to whoever wants to come and see it or participate in it. I hire about, you know, two dozen students every year to 
work on the nuts and bolts of measuring this and that. And so, you know, it is really a collaborative effort and it's open to the, to anybody to become involved. And even if you want to do your own mother tree projects, you know, to test, you know, how, for example, in the Amazon, you know, there are the ab- Aboriginal people there also recognize the, the value of old, old trees and save them, you know, when they harvest different parts of the forest because they help keep the forest intact and reproductive and reduces risks of fires. And, you know, because they, they actually keep the forest moist and humid. And so, you know, it'd be really good to try these different ways of saving these old trees in different environments, because it will be different, right? It's got to be attuned to the land. There'll be unique features about those species and that land and those people and, And so I would encourage people, if you're interested, you can do your own work and you can consult with us and or ask advice if you want, or just look at what we're doing and and go test things yourself. Be a scientist yourself. Be a citizen scientist. That's a huge theme of our podcast. I love the overlap uh, where citizen scientists, concerned amateurs can get involved and really do something. And you just highlighted another theme throughout the book. The difference is in land, you know, you're very careful not to make overgeneralizations about every, you know, every landscape is different. There are microclimates, not only at elevation, but just everywhere is different. So if more people get involved with the Mother Tree Project where you are, we start putting together a much more comprehensive picture of how to effectively implement some of this knowledge you brought forth in all of these different environments. Yes, I really encourage people to get involved with the Mother Tree Project. We'll put up links to everything else so people can find your work, listen to your talks. And again, I can't reiterate enough for people how important I think it is for people to be familiar with your work. If you're interested in mushrooms, if you're interested in the forest, you know, you are someone who laid the foundation for so much of the common understanding now that we have. So there's no better source to go to, to learn more about these topics. And I'll have you leave us here with three questions that I like to ask all of my guests and I'm really excited to hear hear your answers. And the first one, sometimes it's the toughest, but just a mushroom that you love and why, and it doesn't have to be a favorite. You know, we won't ascribe massive importance. Maybe it's something you just thought of now, but a mushroom you love and why? <sighs> you know, there's so many beautiful mushrooms. I They're so colorful. I mean, the Amanita muscaria, of course, are brilliant, but they're deadly. I love the Cortinarius uh, genus because it's very diverse and you know you know there's thousands of species and we don't really know that much about what they do but they've got these beautiful veils like where the the veil sticks to the stem and the thready things that come off the the cap and sticks to the stem I love those mushrooms and they've got this kind of dusty rusty orangey different colors. I love our malaria honey mushrooms even though it's a pathogen it it I was going to say you love the pathogen. I love the pathogen <laughs> mushrooms. I mean, they they come out in cascades out of when they infect a tree. They they fruit right at the base of the tree, like the firs and even the birches will have you know these big cascades of mushrooms coming down their stems and onto their roots and before they die. And they're beautiful, right? That, that cluster of mushrooms coming out. Yeah, all of those answers are fantastic. And especially, you know, you highlight Cortinarius, you know, I think that's one that is a pretty significant mycorrhizal role player, even though we don't fully understand all of its function yet, right? Mm-hmm. Even the our malaria can form mycorrhizas on some species, like it's not always a pathogen. It can actually form a mycorrhiza on some of the little understory species. So it's very flexible. It can be a saprophyte, a pathogen or a mycorrhizal fungus, which is incredible. It's so flexible. Of course, you leave us pepper in just like a mind-blowing thing right there. The fact that this pathogenic fungi can form mycorrhizal relationships. Yeah. And that's a whole other area in terms of the flexibility. You talk about that in the book, the flexibility of these species. They don't necessarily fit one mold. And I'm always thinking, are basically every capacity we see in fungi available to some extent in the genetics you know, if they have to, and it kind of, they just evolve and select based on their environment over time. Um, Yeah. So a a whole nother rabbit hole to (laughs) to go down for people. Um, And then a big broad question. And as someone who is so intimately involved with the trees, what has this relationship you've developed with fungi uh, and mushrooms given to you? You know, what has 
understanding and learning about these organisms brought to your life. And that could be, you know, anything spiritual, uh, scientific perspective, whatever it is. But just what is that relationship given to you? Well, when, when you start noticing things in the forest, um, like mushrooms or slugs or lichens, <laughs> when, whatever you're going to be looking at, it gives you such a perspective into the forest. It, it, it brings you into the details of it. I think a novice forest person or hiker will walk through the forest and it's like a lot of green, right? And there, yeah, there's trees and there might be some plants, but there's not a lot of, you know, so you can just walk by things and it's a green blur. But when you can actually see and you know, understand and you know certain things like, oh, that's an, a honey mushroom or that's a pancake mushroom or that's a an amanita, you actually start to understand it more, right? Your curiosity gets you to dive into something deeper. And I guess, you know, the world of mushrooms has helped me do that. It's looking at the small things, these small, beautiful things. And then understanding that what you see is just like this, the tip of this huge iceberg of activity below ground and it's beautiful constellation of activity and, and realizing those tiny things are really actually super, super important. The things that we can't see below the surface are like basically driving so much of what gives us life and, you know, even what we can't see, we can't take it for granted. And then also, I, I wanted to say too, you know, I study these mycorrhizal networks, but lots of things form networks and linkages in forests. I mentioned about the above ground communication of trees. There's also like even birds, like they create webs as well. So they have what's called nest webs where they share each other's nests, where a, a primary cavity nester will create a cavity in a tree and it will eventually vacate that tree and make room for a bigger bird, which you know, as it decays, will vacate it eventually and another bigger, maybe a bear will move in that. And so that they form a web, an interspecies web in the forest. And it's connected to the mycorrhizal network as well. Like they're linked together too, in that the, that the birds will disperse seeds or they'll disperse spores. And the fungus will provide some food for the beetles that kill the tree that create, you know, the decay that the birds can then create their nests in. And so I, I want to emphasize that, you know, I study mycorrhizal networks, but there are so many different kinds of linkages in forests. The mycorrhizal network are a nice metaphor for the other ones because we can physically understand them, whereas these other ones right. are less visible and concrete, but they nevertheless are still relationships and connections in forests. So it's given me that, pers I think it's helped give me that perspective. Powerful symbols to illustrate just the overlapping complex networks ever present in every forest ecosystem. I think for so many of us, it does open that concept up of this idea of a network because it physically represents it. That's beautiful. Uh, and then this final question, again, pretty general, but just well, you know, what is your greatest aspiration or hope for the future of humans developing a more intimate relationship with fungi. And, you know, I could broaden this and just say developing a more intimate relationship with the forest. What do you hope that does or, or positively affects human culture and human society? I, I think ultimately I would like the world to, I mean, we have, we have this innate ability to understand about the wholeness of things. Like, we evolved from trees, right? We evolved from all other eukaryotic cells and cellular organisms. And, and so we have this innate understanding. So what I want is people to tap back into that thing that's in them already. Like when you talk to people, I'm sure you notice it too, when you talk to them about mycorrhizal networks and nurturing of mother trees that they go, oh, you know, I don't know how many times somebody said to me, I, already, I always knew that in my heart. And it's absolutely true, right? It, you know it in your DNA because you evolved from that thing. And so my hope is that people will get back to that that basic understanding that we all have and honor it and respect it and then convey that respect back to the our natural environment because that is really, you know, our life-sustaining systems and create a better world for all people, all diversity of creatures, our children, all multiple generations coming up. That's my hope. We've gone astray, but maybe by just looking and listening to natural systems, systems of the forest, mycorrhizal fungi, we can kind of remember that interconnectedness that'll get us to the more beneficent future that I think we want. Well, Suzanne, I will reiterate for any listeners again, 
you need to read this book. It's a powerful explanation of how these systems work, humanizes the science, also tells a beautiful story about an inspirational figure in the study of forest ecology and mycology. But thank you so much for coming on the Mushroom Hour. You know, I had, I think, 11 pages of notes. And, you know, I start jumping around and asking these incredibly long-winded questions. And you did a great job of transforming that into insights and stories. And uh, you, you were a very gracious guest. And I, I was honored to spend time with you. So thank you so much for coming on the Mushroom Hour. Thank you, Darren. You, your questions were excellent. Yeah. Thank you for the conversation. That was really fun.